welcome to VCE Psychology. Today we'll be learning about the nervous system. The first stop point on the study design is the roles of different divisions of the nervous system, including the central and peripheral nervous systems and their associated subdivisions, in responding to and integrating and coordinating with sensory stimuli received by the body. So, what is the nervous system? It's a complex, highly organized network of specialized cells. It receives, then processes, then responds to information. It controls everything in the body, either voluntarily or involuntarily. It also communicates between internal cells and organs and the external environment. This graphic shows the branches of the nervous system. The building blocks of the nervous system are neurons and glia. Neurons are individual nerve cells that receive, process, and or transmit information to other cells. Glial cells support the neurons' functions by making myelin and cleaning debris. The central nervous system is made out of the brain and spinal cord. The brain is a network of cells in your skull. It processes information, directs actions, and controls all functioning. The spinal cord has two major functions via the peripheral nervous system. The first is to receive sensory information from the body via afferent ascending tracts and send it to the brain for processing. The second is to receive motor information from the brain via efferent descending tracts and send it to muscles, organs and glands. And tracts are just bundles of nerve fibres in the spine. In summary, the spinal cord is a pathway for messages to and from the brain. The next stop point is the distinction between conscious and unconscious responses by the nervous system to sensory stimuli, including the role of the spinal reflex. The spinal cord can also initiate simple motor reactions, known as reflexes, that occur independently of the brain. These are unconscious, involuntary and automatic responses, because the information is only processed in the brain after the reflex occurs. It's also considered as adaptive because it saves time in potentially harmful situations. Here's an example of the reflex arc. First, receptor cells detect the heat and then send a neural message to a sensory neuron. The sensory neuron carries this message along an afferent ascending tract to the spinal cord. Then, interneurons in the spinal cord relay the message to a motor neuron. Then the instructions to withdraw the hand go down the efferent descending tract to the motor neuron. While the reflex is occurring, the message is also carried up the spinal cord to the brain so that you can perceive the pain after the reflex has occurred. We talked about the central nervous system before. Now, let's discuss the other main division of the nervous system, the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system consists of all other nerves connecting to the central nervous system, for example, in your arms and legs. It carries information to and from muscles, organs, and glands. This is further divided into the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is involuntary. Here, we have the sympathetic nervous system, which is fight or flight. It's activated immediately and is stimulated by stresses. The opposite of that is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest or digest. It comes into play after the sympathetic nervous system to bring the body back to normal, which is homeostasis. The autonomic nervous system is linked to the cerebral cortex and controls visceral muscles, organs, and glands, which are internal. The somatic nervous system is voluntary. It communicates with sensory organs and is involved in all skeletal muscle activity, which is external. The acronym SAME can be used to remember the names of the types of information involved in the somatic nervous system. Sensory information is afferent, and motor information is efferent. The next stop point in the study design is the role of the neuron, dendrites, axon, myelin, and axon terminals as the primary cell involved in the reception and transmission of information across the synapse. Now, I'm going to explain how information is transmitted across a neuron. 
Neurons receive, process, and or transmit information in the form of action potentials, which are electrical signals that travel across the axon. Dendritic spines with receptor sites receive chemical messages called neurotransmitters, which are converted to electrical signals. The dendrites pass information to the soma. The soma is the cell body which houses the nucleus. It collects, integrates and processes information, passing it to the axon. It also produces neurotransmitters. Axons transmit action potentials away from the cell body. A cable-like bundle of multiple axons is called a nerve. On the axon, we have myelin sheaths. These are insulators that surround and protect the axon, minimizing interference from nearby axons and speeding up the impulse conduction rate. The gaps between myelin sheaths are called nodes of Ranvier. These allow electrical impulses to jump from node to node quickly, speeding up transmission. Finally, we reach the axon terminal. This is composed of collaterals, terminals, and lastly, terminal buttons. Terminal buttons store and secrete neurotransmitters into the synapse, which is a gap between the terminal and the dendrites of two adjacent neurons. There are three types of neurons. Sensory neurons detect stimuli from the environment, such as the smooth surface of a ball. Motor neurons carry action information, such as how to drop a ball. Interneurons are found in the central nervous system and serve as the middleman or interpreter between sensory and motor neurons. Let's look at an example. When your hand gets pricked by a pin, your sensory receptors detect this and send the information directly to interneurons in the spinal cord. The interneurons then relay instructions to motor neurons to immediately draw back your hand. After that, the information is transmitted to the brain and you perceive the pain. The next stop point is the role of neurotransmitters in the transmission of neural information between neurons, the lock and key process, to produce excitatory effects with glutamate or inhibitory effects with GABA. The four elements of chemical neurotransmission are terminal buttons, synaptic gap, dendrites, and reuptake. Neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that are produced in the neuron. First, Neurotransmitters are released by terminal buttons in the presynaptic neuron into the synaptic gap. Then, these bind to receptor sites in the dendrites on the postsynaptic neuron. Reuptake can happen when neurotransmitters that do not bind to receptors are absorbed back into the terminal buttons, but other neurotransmitters are just diffused. The two most common neurotransmitters in the central nervous system are glutamate and gamma-aminobutyric acid, also known as GABA. Glutamate stimulates postsynaptic neurons to perform their functions, whereas GABA blocks postsynaptic neurons from firing action potentials. Glutamate is associated with learning and memory, and GABA is associated with maintaining neurotransmission at an optimal level. Too much glutamate can lead to neuronal damage, and too little GABA can lead to anxiety. Every different type of dendritic spine and neurotransmitter has a chemically distinctive shape. This is why we call the binding of neurotransmitters to dendrites the lock and key process. The neurotransmitter acts like a key which fits perfectly into certain specialized locks, which are the receptor sites on the dendrites. The neurotransmitter unlocks the receptor site and enables it to fire. Essentially, the neurotransmitters can only affect receptor sites that match its shape. The final dot point on the study design is the effects of chronic changes to the functioning of the nervous system due to interference to neurotransmitter function as illustrated by the role of dopamine in Parkinson's disease. A range of interferences can occur in neurotransmission. First, neural loss and degeneration means that there are not enough neurons to produce neurotransmitters. Structure or substance buildup can inhibit transmission and reception of neurotransmitters. Structures or substances can also compete with neurotransmitters at receptor sites, inhibiting neural reception. Also, bacteria or disease can deplete neurotransmitters before they can perform their function. An example of interference in neurotransmission is Parkinson's disease. It is caused by interference to dopamine production which means that there is a deficiency of dopamine. 
Dopamine is a neurotransmitter which coordinates voluntary movement and reward-based learning. Parkinson's affects both motor and non-motor functions and is characterized by neural damage and loss in the substantia nigra of the basal ganglia in the brain. These are some of the characteristic symptoms of Parkinson's disease. There's a loss of control of voluntary movement, such as hand tremors and stooped posture. There's also non-motor symptoms, like fatigue and constipation. That's all for today for nervous system functioning.